am going to invite um, uh, Hermela Aragawi. Um, uh, we just heard a little bit about her. I think uh, most of you know the uh, campaign that has been waged against her um, simply for uh, asking some questions. And, um, um, and these are the same questions that we would love for them to be asked because we want answers to issues and answers to real questions. So um, Hermela, if you can see me, um, I would like to give you if you have a few, if you want to share for a few minutes. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Yami. Um, so, okay, I'll say a little bit about myself first. I've been working as a journalist for 10 plus years now. Um, both my parents happen to be of Tigrayan descent. I was born in Addis Ababa and I moved to the States um, when I was seven years old. So I grew up mostly here. So with that said, I just wanna start at the beginning of this to maybe explain to people that don't understand or people that wanna understand why I came to this place I am in about my perspective on what's going on. So in November, when the war uh, in Tigray started, it captured the hearts and minds of many of us with connections to Ethiopia, particularly in Tigray. And the communications blackout fed into the fears of many, including myself, who had and have family in Tigray. Um, and then immediately after the hashtag Tigray genocide also began, which really fed into a lot of the fears of many people. That hashtag was started by Tigrayan activists. Uh, that word genocide is a heavy and legally binding word. Um, and so it really fed into the fears of so many people um, like myself. And in the last 11 months, I think that word has really been weaponized to make sure that people can't ask questions about what's going on, which is really unfortunate. And the same people that are using that hashtag don't seem to be concerned about humanitarian aid being used or redirected into war. Um, they're same people that use the hashtag, at least some of them, um, uh, and I have been in meetings where they have deterred people from contributing to organizations that were trying to send basic necessities to Tigray at the time that the federal government was in control of Megara, and it seemed uh, and was said that it was a political uh a political um, strategy so that the government would not look good, so that things would not get better so quickly. Um, and so those kind of things are things I heard in private, is things that I pushed back about in private. Um, and it were things that did not get better and actually ended up getting worse. And a lot of the money that was being raised was being pushed in one direction. And that direction uh, was organizations that were not being held accountable about where that money went. I would ask where it's going, other people would ask where it's going, and the answer was basically none of your business, right? So those kind of things were concerning to me at a time where people were uh, saying that they cared about the humanitarian crisis. So during that blackout in the first couple of months, there were reports of atrocities that leaked out. Uh, the reports uh, by media outlets like CNN and the New York Times where they said there were atrocities and civilians killed by Ethiopian and Eritrean soldiers, and it was said to be of civilians. I, as a journalist, found that a little bit peculiar and suspicious and did not retweet uh, some of those uh, people who were said to have been killed by these forces because I thought that was odd to be able to corroborate that at a time of a communication blackout. As I looked more into it, I saw the original sources of those reports were Tigrayan activists, uh, people like, or organizations like Tigray Media House, which just is publicly known to be an entity that supports uh, the political forces in Tigray. Nonetheless, those reports were concerning, but over time, it appeared to be one-sided. There were never any reports about Tigrayan forces that may have maybe um, committed some atrocities, which I found as a journalist to be really um, suspicious. So, Let's fast forward to June when the New York Times reported that the Tigray rebels claimed victory and captured Megale or the federal government retreated, however you want to paint it. After that, the next two months, um, there were reports about the Ethiopian government blocking aid. Um, there were reports of famine. There were photos that were released that I saw in, a AP, in an AP article where the photo was unanimously released, or rather anonymously released. And in my work, we don't do that. If you're talking to uh, a hospital like Ida Hospital, which the reporter was speaking to, um, and you're talking about famine in that hospital or uh, famine victims in that hospital, you get the sources or the photos from 
that hospital. So I found those kind of things to be suspicious. Um, and then during that time, there were videos and photos on specifically Tigray Media Houses where I, what I saw, where there were trucks and aid trucks, trucks with logos uh, of WFP, I believe it was, that were transporting what appear to be hundreds, if not thousands of soldiers into the Amhara and Afar regions. So those were just data points I was sort of collecting. I didn't know how to connect them yet. And then mid-September, the UN Ethiopia talked about 466 trucks, aid trucks, that went into Tigray since July 12th, and only 428 had come out since July 12th, and we're talking about mid-September. So for two months, these international aid, ag aid agencies could not account for 428 trucks. That in a country like Ethiopia is not a small resource. Um, and so I started to do a little bit more research. I saw that the Tigrayan leadership said it was because of fuel. Um, the Ethiopian government said they suspected that it, those trucks were being used for logistics. So I looked into it um, and based on what the UN itself said in terms of how much fuel went in during that time, there were in fact enough uh, fuel to, for them to return. So in that period, there's a September 5th BBC report that says that Tigray forces, or the uh, officials in Tigray said Tigray forces claimed they killed 3,073 enemy forces, I'm quoting. That is not a small number. I mean, if we just wanna contextualize it, that is more than the number of people killed in 9-11. And we didn't hear any outrage of all of those uh, young Tigrayan forces being killed. They also said there were about 4,400 injured. Ethiopian government said they killed 5,600 rebels and uh, injured about 2,000. So that that particular uh, those particular battles happened at a time where we could not account for nearly 500 aid trucks. I thought it was peculiar that those who claimed to be humanitarian activists didn't care about those trucks that were missing and that appeared to be being redirected to war. In fact, uh, people came at me for even asking the question, why are you obsessed with trucks? Um, <laughs> and, and so I just, you know, those kind of things to me are so mind boggling. Um, but I think it speaks to the brainwashing that is happening with Tigrayan activists who don't encourage questions. I've been in the inside of it for the first six months or so in the advocacy. So I know how uh, one message one uh, um, uh, sort of approach is encouraged and anything outside of that is discouraged. So uh, let me just move forward a little bit. Save up to 70% on your favorite brands at Nordstrom Rack. So, good. Um, so that, that to me was the biggest thing. And so when I started speaking out, um, I was actually gonna stay silent. I was gonna say, I was thinking, hey, let's see if this gets better. Um, if it gets better without me, great. Like, I don't need to be involved. I've got my own life. I've got a job that's separate of this, but it didn't get better. The advocacy became very toxic. Um, it became about calling Ethiopia Shitopia. It became about, uh, you know, they're only targeting you because you're Tigrayan. And it completely disregarded these issues with the humanitarian aid and these issues of a war that was happening that was killing thousands of poor and voiceless people is what it, it looks like. Um, and then that moves me into the harassment, which Yemi mentioned. Um, there is a petition. A petition was started to get me fired from my job at CBS LA, which I have been at for three years. Um, and it said that I was pro Tigray genocide. So the, those kind of things really put into question whether the cause was a humanitarian cause at all. And I just think um, there may be a lot of good people that happen to have to grand roots that have been brainwashed and fooled that, that, that aren't asking these questions. And then there's a lot of people that have their own agenda, um, that have their own political ties, that are actually getting paid for the work that they do, that are uh, um, being represented and paid by uh, lobby groups, like I believe it's called Von, von Batten. Um, there's millions of money that's being raised in the diaspora and no one knows where it's going. We say there's a communication blackout in Tigray and there's issues with banking services, but still fundraisers continue to happen. So it really begs the question as to where are those going and how are they getting there? And are they actually, is that money being used to fuel war? Um, and so that's, 
that's sort of what led me to this point. I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you so much for the time. Oh, I think I want to take a deep breath. Uh, thank you, Hermela. Um, ask the questions. Ask the questions. Keep pressing and asking the questions and get the information. 